The locomotive whistles and groans, grime billows from it. They shoot through cock fosters, and in an instant, it seems, are in the countryside, passing villages at breathtaking speed. This is just the second time Sherlock has been on a locomotive. They are likely exceeding 45 miles an hour. He gapes out the window, but his mind never leaves the other danger. Standing now in his seat at the far end of the carriage, dressed in that sailor suit, with a finger up to the knuckle in his nose. The little boy leans forward to dig even deeper. When he does, Sherlock sees something that makes his blood run cold. Directly behind the child, a railway guard sits calmly reading a paper. He must have boarded at the last stop. Sherlock had been too busy looking away. All he can do now is pray that the boy never turns around, that the family is going past St. Neots, and so is the railway employee, who perhaps lives farther north. But then the little devil drops his suite. A putrid purple cane of hard sugar he worried a few times before turning to mine the contents of his nose. It drops to the floor. He looks at it, aghast, falls to his knees on the chugging wooden surface, and seizes it in a pudgy fist. When he gets to his feet, he turns around, facing the guard. No! It is as if the child has expression in the back of his head. And that expression says, yes! In an instant, he is tugging at the blue sleeve of the crisp uniform and pointing up the aisle again towards Sherlock Holmes. Lip reading is a skill that any detective must learn. He has no ticket, sir. Chuck, 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 chuck. Who? Oh, him, sir. The one with the black hair who is peeking at us. The one in the dirty suit coat. Him? The railway guard points. Yes, him. Up gets the guard. The train is still steaming forward at high speed. The man pats the child on the head as if to say, I'm sure you are incorrect, young passenger, but I will ask on your behalf, as a great Northern Railway employee should. He fixes his eyes on Sherlock and steadies himself. Then he staggers down the aisle toward him. No, they are in a sealed rocket. There is no way out, but getting caught is unthinkable. The door at Sherlock's end of the carriage is several steps up the aisle from where he sits. Glancing around, he notices the opening to a round ventilation can in the ceiling, just slightly narrower than his shoulders. They line the roof every five feet or so. Sherlock stands up. The sign for Potter's Bar Village flashes by. There is no good reason to be on his feet. There is no water closet on this third-class carriage, no place to go for food. It gives away his crime. But he has to do something. What? He isn't sure. He edges along the bench toward the aisle. The locomotive gives a heave and decelerates rapidly. The guard almost falls on his face. Sherlock slips into the aisle and races for the door. Can someone actually survive a leap from a moving train? Yep, young lad, shouts the guard, so loudly that everyone hears him above the engine's chugs and clacking iron wheels. Arriving at the door, Sherlock seizes the bell on the window and pulls it. The window falls open. He feels the cold air on his face. Don't do it, lad, shouts the guard. He stops no more than six feet away. The train rocks violently as its brakes squeal. Sherlock looks outside. The ground is still a blur. He doubts he can struggle through the opening without the guards seizing him. They must be about to enter Potter's Bar. That's why they are slowing. It is still countryside out there. As Holmes hesitates, the guard takes a step toward him. The boy looks out again. He can't be caught. He puts his hand through the open window, draws the bolt on the outside, and snaps the door open. Now the freezing air hits him like a gale. The guard lunges. Sherlock jumps.